Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue, and welcome to this week's Visitor's Edition. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Joining us in just a moment will be Steve Pulity from the Newark Star-Ledger. He covers Rutgers football, and he'll share his thoughts on the state of the program, Saturday's game, and much more. First, let's get it rolling with my view from Section 17. We have been very fortunate avoiding major injuries this year, and other than losing Dylan McCaffrey with his broken collarbone last week, we are actually getting healthier. Rashawn Gary is back, says he feels good, and will be back in the rotation this week. The same for Tariq Black. He says he's full speed, and he sure looked like he was last week in very limited action. Every day this week we hear how bad Rutgers is, and my guest in just a moment thinks so too, but it's still a road game, and we have to stay focused on the task at hand. So while these games do make us nervous, I think this team is in a different zone. They seem to understand that you can't let down, and they are on a mission. It's one day at a time, one game at a time. I think we're going to take care of business and keep the momentum going. I'm also hoping we can get the backups some action and get Shea off the field so he doesn't get dinged up or hurt. With McCaffrey down, we just can't afford anything happening to Shea. There just doesn't seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel for Rutgers football and for their fan base. Chris Ash took over a few years ago, and things seem to have gone from bad to worse. That's what my guest thinks anyway. Steve Politi from the Newark Star-Ledger is up next here on The Michigan Man on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. With us on our visitor segment is Steve Politi from the Newark Star Ledger and NewJersey.com to uh, talk about the game on Saturday. Great to have you back with us, Steve. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Well, before we touch on the game, Steve, uh, let's chat about what's happening in Piscataway, uh, the state of the program. It just seems to be brutal right now. Yeah, it's been, they've had better a uh, few weeks, <laughs> to put it, to put it uh, <laughs> bluntly. Uh, you know, the, the, the latest uh, player arrest was sort of an eye-opener mm-hmm. uh, uh, attempted wa- a murder by, by a walk-on that uh, sort of turned the bye week into into a circus. Uh, they had uh, several players charged with uh, credit card fraud in the off season that sort of de- decimated the depth on defense. Uh, and of course, the team is you know the team is one and eight. Uh, you know they played better the last two weeks, but still overall, you know it's just it, it, seems, it seems almost certain that we're headed to a one and eleven season. Well, when Chris uh, Ash came in with such high hopes several years ago, it's been a struggle since then. 
is he going to be able to hang on to his job? I think so. I'm, you know, he he signed uh, you know, as part of his deal when he came in. He he received a, a contract extension based on the fact that uh, the program put on NCAA probation based on what happened under Kyle Flood. Uh, so he's got another you know four years after this on his contract, ten million dollars. You know, I don't think people in Piscataway and Rutgers have the stomach to to swallow that at this point. Uh, and I believe that he's got you know, that Pat, Patrick Hobbs, the athletic director, is you know there there aren't many people still on his ship, but Patrick Hobbs certainly uh, has belief in his head coach and uh, you know doesn't want to make a change uh, at the top uh, you know until until or unless it's completely necessary. And I think he believes after three years uh, that that Ash still deserves time to bring in his own you know full bodies of recruiting classes and and build the program his way. Well, the thing that must frustrate the uh, Rutgers fan base is that New Jersey is such a talent-rich state. Just look at our roster. We thank New Jersey. What what can Rutgers possibly do to turn it around and keep more of that talent at home? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the age-old question. And it's funny, it's not not just it's not just football. It's, I think a lot of New Jersey students go out of state for, for college, but certainly, you know, if you look at the top 50 recruits, historically, it's been a struggle for Rutgers to get even 10 of them. Uh, and that's, you know, and then that's been a good year for Rutgers. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, and the problem I think now is, are right, you going to lose recruits to Ohio state and Michigan? You kind of understand that uh, it's that you're losing recruits to Syracuse and Boston college. And you've got teams in the, nor- the Northeast who are, you know, having very good seasons in the top 25. I mean, you know, it's going to be the, the game of the week is at Boston College this week. Um, you know, you see that when that happens. So that's that's an even bigger problem for for Chris Ash because he, you know, you when you're losing ground to to programs that for 10 years or more, you know, Rutgers had stepped over. So I think that's kind of where it's at now. It's 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 been an even harder hill to climb for recruiting when you've got so many competitors in the state. Every Rutgers fan I know just seems to be so fatalistic when you talk to them about uh, their future. Uh, and, and, you know, it's in their DNA, though. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of yeah, it's, well, it's understandable too. You know, in some of the uh, the blogs this week, I was seeing the Rutgers fans saying, "Why are we in the Big Ten? Why did we join the Big Ten? Let's think about this." The fan base seems to have really checked out on a lot of levels. Yeah, and I, you know, and I get those emails all the time about the after every loss, you know, the Big Ten was a mistake. They should be playing Cornell and Lehigh and <laughs> Colgate like they used to, which is I mean, which is just utter nonsense. Of yeah. course, they, you know, Big Ten was the best thing that's ever happened to that program. It, you just got to get better, uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. And I think the bigger frustration is that this team, you know, where it was in two thousand six, seven, eight. You know, it would have been a competitive team. It would have, you know, it's hard to believe, but Rutgers beat Michigan 40 years ago. It wasn't like in the dark ages. I mean, lots has changed, but I get it. But, you know, it is possible uh, to to, to get, to build a program to the point where I don't think it's going to, you know, compete with Ohio State. But, you know, certainly there's no reason why it can't be a six, seven, eight win team uh, every few years and go to a bowl game. They're just a long ways from that right now. So at this point, the administration, the athletic department still has full faith in Chris Ash. It seems like, yeah, I don't, you know, certainly the athletic director does. I don't know where, you know, it's not necessarily a booster culture at Rutgers, but I don't know where all of the, the high profile money guys stand. But, you know, I don't know that there's something, I think they're expecting to lose these last three games. You know, if it's a 78 nothing situation again, well, maybe that, maybe that shakes some things loose. But uh, right now, I think it's a very, very low percentage that he there would be a change. Are they still getting fairly good crowds at the games? No, <laughs> the crowds is, <laughs> the crowds have abandoned the, the program. The, you know, uh, fifteen thousand rough count uh, for the Northwestern game. A lot mm. of purple in the stands because of the New York presence for 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 Northwestern. I mean, I think it's going to be a heavy Michigan crowd. Uh, and the one the one bet the one thing that's happened that's been good for Rutgers is that Penn State has taken a few losses, so I don't know it'll be quite people were expecting another whiteout in Piscataway if Penn State was on the field or close to it. So that seemed like that might be less of the case. But yeah, it's gonna be it is gonna be a Michigan crowd uh, on Saturday. Well I've been reading a lot this week about the uh, seventy eight to nothing Michigan win a couple of years back and even Coach Ash said he understood Michigan you know, running it up. Uh, back then, is that a hot button topic with Rutgers fans? You know, it uh, a little bit, but and I think people saw the score and thought it was running up. I, I watched the game and I, I clearly did not. I did. I mean, I don't think you can run up a score against a conference foe in the first half, certainly, uh, and then the second half. I mean, it was just you know it, it, routine runs being broken off for 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 large touchdowns, and this is when Rutgers thought it was going to run a high tempo 
spread offense, and mm-hmm. they would go three and out, and eleven seconds, and punt the ball back to Michigan, <laughs> and Michigan would score. I mean, it was just it was just all it was just kind of crazy. Uh, and Rutgers didn't have a first down until the fourth quarter, so you know, I, I mean, I really did not at the time think that Harbaugh run it up, ran it up. Um, you know, I'd be interested to see what he does this time around. Uh, if it's in that same situation, I mean, I don't know if he has to impress voters or has to impress people to get in the playoffs. Probably not, but. It's, it's more of a factor than it would have been last year or two years ago. Well, last week after the Wisconsin game, you wrote that it won't get better until Rutgers gets beefier. Of course, using Wisconsin as a measuring stick might not be fair. They are just incredibly, ridiculously massive human beings, as you said. <laughs> but how undersized on both sides of the ball is this Rutgers team right now? Yeah, it, it, it's very noticeable. And I think that's what the jarring part against Wisconsin is that when, you know, Jonathan Taylor is an excellent running back, but he, he routinely had four yards before he touched the ball. I mean, that was, you know, that was just you're know, watching this going, wow. Uh, and I think that that's been a problem in the Big Ten. Uh, it's not necessarily just size. It's also development. I, I, we haven't seen Rutgers develop, uh, especially offensive linemen. You know, it just seems like that's been a, a problem in the program. Even when they get big physical bodies, uh, that just have a hard time, you know, turning what would be a three-star, six-three, three hundred pound kid into a good offensive lineman. Good programs do that. You don't have to get. There's only so many. You know five-star big men. You don't have to get all those guys. You can still develop it. And, and Rutgers had, has had problems doing it. You know, I think it's the, it's the biggest weakness on the team now. And also, the lack of depth. They don't have a lot of the play. The good players they do have get worn out by the end of the game. Well, last week, quarterback Art Sikowski uh, had a, a decent game against Wisconsin, but uh, as you wrote, if you know anything about this kid, is it's that he can take a hit. And I was watching on YouTube a, a review of the season um, the other day, and has he ever taken some, yes. <laughs> some hits for a young kid? You, yes. you, you worry about where his head is, but uh, as you said, he just... Yeah, he, we're, we're, look at the spill on his shoulder. <laughs> look at the spill attached to his body. I'm less worried. Yeah, but yeah, well, I, I understand your point, absolutely. He is a tough kid, but talk about him and um, his future and what we're going to see on Saturday from him. Yeah, I think the last two weeks have been improvement because you know he had a, this, a historically bad game against Maryland where he had eight passing yards, I think it was 2 for 17 with four interceptions, and it was just, you know, I looked like confused, looked like overwhelmed, looked like he hadn't been developing. The last two weeks he's been better. Uh, you know, I think he's, he has at least hasn't thrown an interception. He's had, he's had some questionable throws, but, you know, he's kept it clean on, on at least that part of the game, which has allowed Rutgers to be at least competitive in those games. Um, but, you know, it's still it's still a hard, long haul for him. He doesn't have a lot of playmakers. You know, the one thing Rutgers had every year was a Leonte Carew or, mm-hmm. you know, or, or you know, or guys like Mohamed Sanu, guys who were really good receivers. He doesn't have that. Uh, and it shows, you know, you, you, a lot of times he is, even when he's been accurate, you know, Rutgers has not been able to win those jump balls on those cl- close catches. Uh, it almost always goes the other way. And, you know, that those little plays on third down, you know, that makes a big difference in the game. Well, on offense, the only name that I really hear about is uh, Raheem Blackshear. Uh, he, he, he's a weapon. He uh, did well receiving last week, maybe not uh, picking up many yards uh, out of the backfield. But who else on that offense at the skill positions has shown any promise this year, Steve? Yeah, well, there's another running back, Isaiah Pacheco, who had a, who had a broke off the longest play for Rutgers, 48-yard run against Northwestern. He's a fresh, true freshman. Uh, you know, so he's kind of splitting backfield duties with Blackshear, who, like you said, I mean, they found something against Wisconsin in the passing game with little screens, and he's the one guy on the team that can make people miss. Uh, there's really nobody at receiver, and this has been a, a big problem. They have, have a four-star kid named Bo Melton, who you know has all the promise and the, the great practice player, but he has yet to take that step to be the reliable target they need. Uh, and you know, I think John McNulty, who's the offensive coordinator, when he came, wanted to make this a vertical offense. And Art Sikowski has a great arm. They just haven't been able to make connect on anything down the field this season. Well, looking at the numbers, I'm guessing it's really hard to find any positives on the defensive side of the ball, Steve. Um, single one kid out who who has looked good and is having a good year would be safety uh, Saquon Hampton. He looks like a guy that might play on Sundays. Absolutely, yeah, and he had a great game, a couple of NFL interceptions uh, last week. Uh, you know, the problem when you're giving up 300 yards routinely rushing <laughs> is that, you know, opponent, opposing teams don't have to throw the ball. I mean, it was amazing to me that Wisconsin was trying to pass in the first half. Eventually, they stopped. And when the, when, uh, when Hornerberg got injured, they just went to the run entirely uh, and just dominated the game. 
Um, so that's, you know, that's the other side of it that, you know, Rutgers is losing the battles in the trenches and it isn't getting support at linebackers that really the cornerbacks and safeties, even though they have promise and a couple other kids in the, in the secondary, you know, I think are going to become good players. They just haven't had to have that big role in the defense uh, the way you would think they would. Other than Hampton, who are some of the other names on the defense uh, that we're going to hear from Saturday? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the kid to Verdoff on the defensive line, he's a freshman. I think he is the most promising lineman. He's a family of a Rutgers family. If you heard the name to mm-hmm. Verdoff, and he's been there a long time. No, it's just that they, you know, they, his brother also played for the program. This kid's a freshman. He's active. He gets in the backfield. He's had a couple of sacks. I think they really like him. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's, the, it's the problem though. There's only there's only a couple of guys. That, you know, uh, Avery Young and a couple that got a couple of cornerbacks who are good. Uh, but really, I think that you know the the problem is just that they don't have enough guys like that. Well, you know, I'm always a believer that you have to bring it every Saturday, or you can get beat. Hey, I was at the uh, Appalachian State game, so. I'm mm-hmm. a believer. Still, it, it's hard to imagine that if Michigan comes in to play, that this doesn't get ugly. Yeah, I, I, I just don't see how Rutgers is going to score. And, uh, you know, uh, that was the problem. Even against Northwestern, you know, all right, that's not obviously not the same level as Michigan, but it was a competitive game that Rutgers had to lead in the second half, but just couldn't get a first down, couldn't convert, couldn't get keep the defense off the field, and it just felt like the outcome was inevitable. You know, uh, I think that's going to be the problem this week. I just I, I watched the Penn State game. I think Michigan is on. You know, they've got a national championship level defense, and Rutgers, you know, has trouble moving against a bad defense. So I just have a hard time imagining. You know, even if it's not, it might not be. You know, fifty six to nothing, but it's going to be something to nothing. I think that's my analysis, <laughs> or something to seven. It's going to be very hard to imagine Rutgers cracking double digits in points. Well, final question for you, Steve. Uh, Rutgers has had football success not that long ago with uh, Greg Schiano mm-hmm. as head coach. Whether it's Chris Ash or another hire, can you see better days ahead for this program in the near future? Yes, absolutely. I don't know, to find near future is hard. To, I mean, I think it's going to take another couple of years. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, I think people feel like this was a missed opportunity. If this team, you know, the schedule wasn't great this year, but they came out and they got creamed by Kansas and Buffalo and teams like that. You know, I, there's no reason why this team, if it if it can't if it can get some players and develop them, that it can't be a, you know six and six team in a couple of years and get back to a bowl game and at least get to that level where, all right, so you're not dreading Saturdays anymore. You know, <laughs> you're, you're looking at them with, as an opportunity, which is really what it was when I mean, you think about the first year in the Big Ten. You know, Penn State came to town; they they should have beaten them. Michigan came to town; they did beat them. I mean, there was at least this where you you could look at a game and say, hey, there's a chance we can win this. You know, I, I think that would be getting just getting to that point where there's even a little bit of hope. It's still a couple of years down the line, but it's certainly within reach. Our guest here on uh, our visitor segment today has been Steve Politi from the Newark Star Ledger and NewJersey.com. Steve, always a pleasure. We look forward to having you back next year. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Quick hits is next as we wrap it up for another week here on The Michigan Man on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Quick hits today, other than Dylan McCaffrey's broken collarbone, we are in very good shape for Saturday. As we mentioned earlier, Rashawn will be back in the rotation. Tariq Black should get more reps. Let's hope we continue to stay healthy. Here are some game day facts for you. Michigan has won three of the four games in this series. I think we all remember when Rutgers beat us in Piscataway and celebrated like they'd won a national championship. That was on October 4th, 2014. 26-24 26-24 Rutgers. Last year on October 28th in Ann Arbor, we won 35-14. Chris Ash is in his third year as head man, and his record is 7-26. Last year they were 4-8 overall, 3-6 in the Big Ten. 
Their last bowl appearance was in the 2014 Quick Lane Bowl, a 40-21 win over North Carolina. Kickoff is scheduled at 3.30 p.m. on Saturday, and the game is on BTN. Weather should be perfect on Saturday, especially for mid-November, early November. Sunshine with temps in the low to mid-40s, virtually no chance of rain. Next week, we are back home for the final home game of the season, which is hard to believe, isn't it? Our guests will be the Indiana Hoosiers. On Tuesday's game day show, joining us will be beat writer Aaron McMahon from M Live. Then on Thursday's Visitors Edition, we will be joined once again by IU's legendary football and basketball radio voice, Don Fisher. So that will do it for another week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Enjoy the game, everyone. Make sure you come back next week. Have a great Wolverine weekend, everyone. And until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!